Uh, I'll take a moment to draw your attention to an event that's taking place next week. It's called Fallout, Fallout from Phone Hacking, Do We Need Regulation? It's sponsored by the Canadian uh, Journalism Foundation. It's on October 20th, um, which is next Thursday, I think. Um, it, it's from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. It's at Innes Town Hall uh, down at the University of Toronto. And um, uh, according to the flyer, I'm the moderator of this event. Um, but this being, it's a very good cast of speakers. John Hondrick will be speaking, Brian Miles, and John Owen. So the flyers are out there. Please collect one and, and try to come along. If you're free, it should be a good event. So our final panel this afternoon is a panel which will focus on uh, news gathering and access to information. And um, as we've heard throughout the day, this is really an important part of investigative journalism and part of um, um, some really important current issues that are, have been um, uh, taking place in the jurisprudence and in the public debate. And so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, turn the panel over to Ryder Gilliland. And I'll just say um, only a word or two about Ryder. Uh, we're very pleased to have Ryder here today as the moderator of this panel. Um, he is a partner at uh, Blake Castles and Graydon. He's a partner of Paul Shabas's. Uh, Ryder has, um, is part of the media law group at uh, Blake's and has um, in that capacity already been to the Supreme Court of Canada on media cases, very important media cases a number of times. Um, uh, including, uh, including the Criminal Lawyers Association case, which was very much an access to information kind of a case. It was a constitutional piece of litigation. And, um, and uh, Ryder also has the distinction of being um, recognized as one of the top 40 lawyers in Canada under 40. So um, we're very pleased to have him here this afternoon as the moderator of the panel. I'll turn it over to Ryder now, and he can introduce the panel, and we'll get underway. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jamie, and uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to, to be up here with, uh, with such a distinguished panel. We're going from speaking about uh, situations where courts and government are trying to get information from journalists to, to speaking about inf situations where journalists are trying to get information from government and courts. Uh, so uh, from uh, sort of the, the shield to the sword, and uh, as I said, we have a, a fantastic panel uh, on the topic. On the far left, to, to my far left, is, is Robert Cribb, um, who's uh, an investigative journalist at the Toronto Star. I've had the pleasure to work with uh, over many years. He's past president of the Canadian Association of Journalists, um, current president of the CAJ Educational Foundation, a lecturer at uh, Ryerson University, uh, currently the Massey Journalism Fellow at the University of Toronto, and he's co-author of uh, Digging Deeper, a Canadian Reporter's Research Guide. To my immediate left is uh, Suzanne Craig. She is currently the Integrity Commissioner for the City of Vaughan. She has uh, she's a law degree, a Master of Laws from, from Osgood, and she's, uh, she brings the insider's perspective to this topic, having, having been uh, in government uh, in a whole bunch of different capacities for um, well over a decade, uh, and including capacities that relate specifically to the issues that, that we're talking about today um, in, uh, in the privacy regime. Over on my, uh, my far right is uh, Danny Henry, who uh, many in the room will, will know. He's a senior legal counsel at the CBC, where he's been legal counsel um, since 1978. I was surprised to see. He's, he's, he looks, he's, he's aged well. Um, he's uh, in the media bar, I like to think of him as, as the Don Cherry of the media bar. He doesn't hold back with his opinion, so he's a good person to, to add color to, to a Friday afternoon panel. So don't disappoint then. And, uh, and uh, to my immediate right, last but not least, uh, Fred Balance Jones, who's uh, currently a professor at, at uh, King's uh, College in, in Halifax uh, and teaching journalism and has uh, before that over 25 years of, of journalistic experience and uh, is also a co-author of Digging Deeper, a Canadian Reporter's Research Guide and uh, also has written uh, Computer Assisted Reporting, a uh, com comprehensive primer which I expect would also deal with uh, with some access uh, type issues because uh, as we may hear, um, some of these access cases have, have, uh, have involved interesting uses of, of, of computer technology. So uh, without further ado, I thought we'd, we'd start rather than um, than have uh, an opening statement format, uh, I was gonna just 
pose a question which, and the answer will be somewhat of an opening statement because they'll tell us a little bit about uh, each of our speakers and, uh, and, uh, and also hopefully a little bit more about the topic that we're going to be hearing about this afternoon. So um, I'll start with you, Rob, uh, and just asking just the broad question about uh, can you give, uh, give us a sense of the types of cases that you as a journalist would look to uh, access to information legislation to, to assist you with? Sure. Um, access, I mean, in terms of the content and the subject matter, it's the same stuff you guys, you, I mean, I'm sure you're well aware of the kinds of things journalists go after. Uh, it's essentially journalists get up every day and try and figure out what's the most important public interest information that we need to get that, that we don't know and try and figure out how to get it. And it has to do with all the, uh, the standard topics. So health care, environment, uh, education, um, these are the kinds of stories that we typically go for and, and they're, they're the, the kinds of documents that we're trying to get, documents or data, uh, is the stuff that we're not getting in the course of typical daily reporting, right? So it's the stuff that's not released in scrums, it's the stuff that's not released in press releases, it's the stuff that's authentic and, and very, very difficult generally to get access to. Uh, if you read the paper today, 90% of the information in there will be um, sourced through interviews. And those interviews will be generally scripted, they'll be message tracked, uh, they'll come from press releases which are uh, very, very tightly edited and, and very um, strategically worded. And essentially what investigative reporters try and do is look at, look at that and then figure out, okay, so what's behind all of it? And you're not going to get it there. You're going to get it sitting in filing cabinets in government offices or in hard drives in government offices. And the only mechanism by which we can come close to getting at that is this one piece of legislation which protects our right to at least ask the question. But, you know, the biggest indictment of the system, of course, is, is its complete lack of, not complete, but large lack of awareness and utility in newsrooms. Um, do you guys have any sense of percentage of requests filed by journalists of the total FOI requests? How many do you think, what percentage of those come from reporters? Do you have a sense? Anybody? Do you think it's 90%? Seventy? So it's down around 20, between 10 and 20 percent. It depends, it varies from provincial to federal. But if you, if you think about that, thousands of reporters in this country get up every day with the sole intent of trying to get access to important public interest information. That's their job. That's what they're doing for the next eight, ten hours. And much of that information is held by governments, public institutions. And we have a law that protects our ability to, to access it, and yet it is virtually invisible in the newsrooms. And the, the journalists that I work with and know across the country, there's literally a handful of people who, who file access requests routinely as a part of their uh, sort of daily routine. I use it a lot because I'm, I have a psychosis about it. But for, for sort of the average reporter, it's, it's largely um, a meaningless tool. And the reason that is, of course, is they've tried it or they've heard the stories of intransigence, delays, denials, fee estimates that are stratospherically indefensible and uh, they've given up entirely. And it's, it's essentially, you want me to do this really quickly so I'll stop here and just simply say that, uh, but by the way, I'm playing the role of the commercially skeptic on the, on the panel today. So, which you never usually are. Which I never usually am. I'm actually very comfortable in this role. I'm, I'm embracing it. Um, it, it. The system sucks. Um, there's been a complete failure of, of will on the part of government, success of government. It's not even will. It's not a failure of will because there is no will. It's a failure of duty. And what it means at the end of the day is that we know a fraction of what we need to know about how we are governed in this country. Uh, we are uh, blocked by um, political interference routinely and, and a bureaucratic system and culture that is designed to, to frustrate 
any efforts that we that we uh, that we have to access this information. Thank you. Maybe I should ask you, Fred, about the um, the annual newspaper FOI audit. Um, what what is that, and uh, does it uh, does it relate at all to to what, what sort of information are you are you drawing through that audit? Well, the uh, the audit is sort of has a uh, a very specific f role, and that is to compare how governments respond to to requests. This is sponsored by Newspapers Canada. Uh, Susan Down from Newspapers Canada sitting in the back row, and um, the. Um, the, uh, the idea is to see how governments across the country can uh, respond when asked for the same information. And, and, and the thing that always jumps out at us is just how remarkably different um, those, uh, those responses are. Uh, this year, for example, the city of Winnipeg just flat out said, sorry, contracts with uh, contractors, you know, we, when we sign a contract to spend public money, that those contracts are confidential not to be released. And just down the highway, the city of Brandon said, no problem, here it is. city of Saskatoon said, you can have it today. Um, so you see these kinds of, of disparities. Um, and I think this audit has probably made me an unpopular figure in many uh, uh, access coordinator offices across the, the, the country. Um, but I, I think it also uh, sort of shows the way towards asking the question, well, why do we have these problems? What are the sort of structural things that happen inside these, these government bureaucracies? Some of the things that Rob has uh, referred to that lead to uh, sometimes decisions that seem bizarrely different. Uh, Danny, I wanted to ask you the sort of the same question we asked we asked Rob about sort of the use of, of access to information legislation, but, but instead focusing on access to information that comes up through the through the court process. I know obviously the CBC has been involved in a lot of cases uh, involving access to exhibits or, or other court productions. Can you tell us a little bit about how CBC journalists have, have used that process? Well, CBC journalists generally come to me out of uh, frustration. Um, they have tried uh, what would be the root of the simple request uh, from one of the parties to litigation, and they hit a brick wall. They uh, try to get material from court um, as it's going on, hit a brick wall, um, and uh, are uh, told that the only way that they can get access to the exhibits, uh, for example, is um, through an application which uh, typically would involve a lawyer. Uh, and uh, it's become as absurd uh, as uh, having a, an agreed statement of facts read out in youth court uh, and the lawyer is refusing to give a reporter a copy of that agreed statement of facts. And I've had to attend not just once, but two or three times at that hearing uh, to convince the judge uh, to let us have access uh, to an agreed statement of facts. Absurd. Um, what reporters are trying to do is convey to the community what they're entitled to know, which is what's going on in our courts. And if they sat in the room, what would they get? They, well, they'd be able to see uh, video exhibits being played, they'd be able to hear audio exhibits uh, being played, they'd be able to uh, see documents that were being uh, filed, uh, they would be able to listen to everything and, he and see everything that is happening in the room. So we uh, uh, try to get uh, them access to audio and video coverage of the courts. You've seen the um, uh, closing arguments in the polygamy case most recently. You saw uh, cameras in the Court of Appeal and, uh, for uh, many months. Uh, you saw them uh, with, in the Truscott case. You see them in the Supreme Court of Canada all the time. That's one of the ways we get that information to people, but there's a lot of resistance there. Uh, so the next best thing is to give people access to the actual uh, exhibits. Um, and uh, that's you know, if you're reporting on the court case, that's what you want. Sometimes you know, you're doing a story about something else entirely, and there's a court exhibit that could be relevant to that. Um, one of our uh, recent uh, programs that uh, was uh, uh, involved five court applications uh, before we were able to get all the material we wanted, uh, plus an access to information request, uh, is the Ashley Smith case. Uh, a girl who uh, killed herself in a correctional institution uh, while, her, um, uh, while the guards were watching uh, because they were under instructions uh, not to help her until she was helpless. 
Well, she was a little more than helpless by the time they, they got to her. Um, and that was the story that we wanted to do, um, how best to tell it, but through video, which was available in a variety of places. All of this was captured on security cameras uh, in the correctional institutions. So we applied for access to information through access to information in New Brunswick and were given uh, a copy of uh, the institution's video in that province. She was moved around, by the way, from institution to institution uh, as a way of the government not having to account for uh, 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 treating her the way they were and not giving her the psychiatric uh, assessments that she, um, she deserved. And so uh, in New Brunswick, we were able to get access to this video with the correction officer's identities pixelated. Uh, we then applied in Saskatchewan and in Ontario to other institutions. She died in Ontario, but she was in institutions in those two provinces, and we met with very limited uh, success. Uh, in Saskatchewan, we were told we could have access to just the portions, there was a preliminary inquiry there, that we were just the portions uh, of the video that were shown uh, in court. Not everything that was filed, just everything that was shown in court, again, with pictures of the um, uh, faces pixelated. And in Ontario, we were told first that we couldn't get access, then we were told, yes, uh, you know, with the images pixelated. Finally, we were able, you know, through a third level in Ontario courts to the Ontario Court of Appeal to get access uh, to the full video which was filed in court, whether it was the portions uh, that were played in court or not and including the very video of her dying. Uh, and uh, one of the judges in the earlier court proceedings said, you know, I don't think that that's anything that anybody really needs to see. Uh, and the Court of Appeals said, well, there's no harm that's been demonstrated by it, uh, and it could, uh, they acknowledged uh, implicitly, uh, benefit uh, the public to see it. Certainly there was a right to access to that information. And the program that eventually uh, was done, there were two programs that were done, but eventually received um, a Michener Award. Uh, so that's the type of thing you try to do, uh, but you would think uh, that it would be a lot easier than it is. And Suzanne, uh, going from, from the, the courts back, back into the, the government role, and I was hoping you could tell us just a bit about what, what does somebody with the title Director of Corporate Access and Privacy for the City of Toronto, what, what does that job entail? What, what do you do? What, well, what did you do? I what, say. what did I do? Well, it, it's interesting because I'm, I'm flanked by, by journalists uh, of high caliber, um, uh, lawyers of high caliber, and we're in a room of people who are all concerned with uh, access to information, uh, the right of the public to know, and as, uh, as one of the panelists said, uh, to speak. So as Director of Access and Privacy at the City of Toronto, I came to the City of Toronto at a time when the previous director had been, uh, shall we say, because it was in the newspapers, unceremoniously let go. Uh, my understanding, although I, I, I did not have the information at the time, and uh, nor, nor did I ever see the information, is that um, this was the result of an access request for information about uh, the uh, Union Station renovation. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, this particular FOI office and its director, uh, in application of the act, uh, denied access to the information that the requester was, was asking for. What does a director of access and privacy do? They apply the rules of this piece of legislation that's been in place uh, for uh, over 20 years. And the premise is that information must be available to the public. It was put in place after a lengthy task force uh, looking at how to get information to the public because there was no law in place and governments were able to, at their discretion, give information or not. Uh, after listening to many voices, many stakeholders, uh, pieces of legislation were put in place. At the municipal level in Ontario, we have what uh, is known through the acronym as MFIPA. It's the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and it's a mouthful. But what it essentially means is that the public, all the public, uh, members of the public who don't know how to use the system, journalists who should not be differentiated uh, from the rest of the public, lawyers, 
political uh, uh, officers should all have free and timely access to information. My job was to ensure that my staff collected the information from the departments of the city, gathered the information, applied the rules of the act, which is information should be available to the public as a default, and only in limited and specific circumstances should the information be covered by an exemption and redacted. Now, very briefly, I think we'd all feel very comfortable to say uh, there's this nefarious uh, force where people get information and say, we're going to keep it, we're not going to give it to you. As a bureaucrat, and as a proud bureaucrat who has an understanding of the law, but more importantly, an understanding of the complexity of a city and how it's run, I will tell you that that has not been my experience. I do know, however, that there has been, both at the provincial level where I've worked and at the municipal level, political interference. There is a contentious issues process. We know that. What is lacking, I believe, is the ability of directors of access and privacy, FOI coordinators, access and privacy officers in general to be able to independently and autonomously apply the rules of the act so that there is not political interference, which is, I'd like to state, a very small part of the hundreds of thousands of records that go out the door at the municipal level. However, those FOI requests where there is political interference, as the Information Commissioner of Canada has pointed out in March 2011, where you have a, where you have a parliamentary assistant saying, unrelease it, is usually as it relates to the broader public interest. So when the general member of the public is asking for a fire incident report, or when the general member of the public is asking for uh, their, their emergency uh, report because they, went to, they took a ride on the ambulance, that's not an issue, usually. Where you will find political interference is where the stories are big. Taking down the gardener, rebuilding Union Station. These are issues that matter broadly. These are issues that are political, necessarily. And these are times when, as Director of Access and Privacy, unfortunately, there is more at play than just the application of the Act. Um, I'll leave some of the other uh, sure. statements Sure. I was later. actually hoping to, to come right back to you, though, and just ask you if you could break that down. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say there is a, a request for information about, about Union Station. Uh, can, you, can you just take us through how that request comes in, where it goes, where, if there's going to be political interference, that comes up, and, and to some extent, although we'll hear about this more, you know, where does the friction come in? What, what causes the delays? And, and, okay. uh, and, and the Absolutely. I think, uh, again, I'd like to premise that, for the most part, uh, my experience has been that access and privacy professionals working in the FOI offices at the municipal level and at the provincial level believe in what they do. They are isolated, for the most part, in the municipality or in the provincial ministry in which they work, and therefore there's no perk to being an FOI officer, except you believe very strongly in providing timely access to information to members of the public. So the access request comes in. Um, there is a process that is prescribed in the legislation, and we're supposed to follow it in 30 days. There's a statutory time frame within which we have to identify the request. We have to let the program area of the city or the ministry know that a request has come in. They have to let us know if they're records. If they're records, they have to let us know how long it will take them to photocopy them, in what format they're in. We gather the information, we redact the information if necessary, if an exemption applies, if it's discretionary, we try to default to disclosure, we send a fee estimate to the requester, the requester pays the fee estimate, and the records go out. That's what happens in a perfect world. That's my job and has been my job for several years. Again, if someone is asking for a fire incident report, that's not a problem. If someone is asking for a piece of information that on its face is innocuous, that's not a problem. What happens is when someone is asking for a piece of information that has been requested by a political party or has been requested by a member of the media or has been requested by an unknown source but is information about an issue that's been, you know, discussed widely in, uh, in the media, that process 
is not streamlined. That process is layered with a contentious issues process which may or may not uh, reduce uh, the timeliness of, of getting the, the records out. So we have a 30-day time frame in which we have to gather the information, review the information, and get it out the door. And that's what usually happens. And Fred, uh, I mean, you've, you've done studies on this. Uh, the system doesn't always work, and we're hearing that it, it may, the more important the information, uh, the, the, the less the system may work. Uh, what, what uh, can you give us some insight into, I guess, those, those problematic situations where things start to break down and why? No, oh, absolutely. I totally agree with what Suzanne is saying, that, you know, in fact, if you, if you look at the Ministry of the Environment in Ontario, um, well over 95% of all the requests that went to that ministry are for contaminated site reports. They're from, usually from cons environmental consultants or other business people. And they deal with them rather quickly. They even have a special process, pay $30. And, and so, yeah, the system works very well for those, those sort of ordinary requests, which are the vast majority. Uh, where things seem to break down, as you were saying, Suzanne, is when you get into these, uh, these more contentious things. Um, as part of this year's FOI audit, one of the things we did was we got the request logs from the 15 of the largest ministries representing about 87% of all the requests uh, that were processed in Ontario. And uh, in, uh, that was from 2008 to 2010. And looking at that, uh, we found out that uh, for uh, politicians, 48% uh, were completed within uh, 30 days, 42% from media requesters, but if you look at businesses, 82%, um, for example, are, are completed within uh, that, the time limit, 77% from individuals. So right away you see that the, the kinds of requesters who are the, the sorts that might cause a little trouble, the people who want contentious information, they're going to make it public, uh, they're typically waiting uh, longer. The median time to completion for media requests was 42 days uh, compared to uh, 26 for individuals in those ministries that we, we looked at. Now I'll just comment for a minute on the contentious issues management process because uh, several of the ministries gave us data on that. 89% of the requests from the media uh, went into the contentious issues management process. Uh, and compared to only 11.6% uh, of those from individuals and uh, if you look at uh, the numbers that went in from businesses, 0.1% uh, of business requests uh, went into the contentious issues management process. Once into that process, they take longer. Um, without getting into all the numbers, the requests do take longer once they get into the uh, contentious issues uh, management process. So uh, I think it's pretty clear um, that certainly, at least in the case of the Ontario government, and I'm sure this is similar in other, other large uh, bureaucracies across the country, you're asking for something routine, no problem, you want to have something a little more problematic, uh, you're going to wait longer. So what are, what are some of the structural causes of that? Um, I mean, sometimes we get the, the political interference, you know, the Tonieri memo, you know, the unreleased memo, and I think that happens very, very rarely. And that happens every, yeah, but we have also seen an accusation of that happening in Ontario. The information commissioner uh, determined that it was not political uh, interference in, in that case quite recently. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things that, that go on in the system too, I think, and one of them is the, what I would call the sort of um, professional independence of access coordinators. And this varies dramatically across government from the, the research that I've done. Um, for example, in, across the federal government, there are some coordinators who have 100% of the authority to decide whether information will be released. Uh, and this is something that has to be delegated down from the head of the institution, that's from the minister. Um, or sort of the deputy minister, I'm not sure. Um, on the other hand, there are some, uh, there are some uh, departments where delegated authority is, remains very high, especially for things such as the advice exemption that so often causes trouble. And, and so the coordinators sometimes don't have the final say. And uh, one access coordinator I spoke to in, in the federal uh, regime said that when you have a situation like that, things just take take longer. And, and if you don't have that independence, then it can be difficult because your bosses may not want something out or they may want certain exemptions applied. You may look at the law and say, no, this is what it says. So then you've got to kind of make that, that, that sort of Hobson's choice between my, you know, am I going to get along with the boss or am I going to do what's absolutely right? You know what's right. Um, sometimes those are difficult choices um, uh, to make. There's a bunch of other things go on too, I think, and I, I won't go on too long here, but um, 
one of the things I think we see is that access offices, especially in Ottawa, some of them are just overrun, absolutely overrun. Um, and sometimes when budget cuts come along, they're, they're some of the first to be hit. I mean, this memo here, for example, inside the Department of Foreign Affairs, where literally the, the head of the Access Division is begging, please don't cut my budget, we're already way behind and we were just starting um, to get, get caught up. Um, Did you get that through an access request? We got this through an access request when I was doing some uh, research for a chapter uh, in a book that's uh, coming out. Another thing that I think is an issue, um, and, and that is uh, what I call sort of an antiquated system. I mean, I want to file a request. I'm a journalist, member of the public, whatever. I got to, in a lot of jurisdictions, I have to write a letter or fill out a form. I then have to get out a check, a checkbook. Many younger people won't even have one. Fill out a check, put it in the Canada Post mail, or perhaps I'm going to put it into a purulator envelope and send it in. Um, and, then, and then all the, a lot of the informal communications are going to happen by mail or by telephone. Uh, contrast that to British Columbia, which is actually one of the first places to allow you just to file it uh, online and it just goes right in. And I, I've noticed that the, the, the processing uh, is, at least at the beginning, is quicker, although BC has some of the slowest times in the country because they, they work with 30 business days instead of 30... Uh, 30 calendar days. Anyway, there's all sorts of structural things that lead to the system slowing down beyond just simply, you know, um, obstruction. I don't think there's that much obstruction. I think there's a lot of people trying to do the job well. Danny, uh, same question in the, in the court system. Uh, you know, you want to get access to the exhibit. Um, how do you go about doing that? Uh, you know, how's it supposed to work and, and where does that get bogged down, if, if, if at all? Uh, well, when I started at CBC uh, 33 years ago, um, reporters would basically get access whenever they asked for it, uh, and uh, it was a relatively simple process. Um, and uh, we thought that was the common law tradition, silly us. Um, there was a case in Nova Scotia which uh, formally changed the dynamic uh, called Vickery, and uh, this was Claude Vickery, who uh, was a uh, producer uh, uh, with uh, the uh, Fifth Estate. Um, and uh, he uh, had heard uh, that uh, in a particular court proceeding, um, which he hadn't attended because it was not in Halifax, it was in uh, an outlying area in Nova Scotia, he had heard uh, that there was a video uh, uh, confession, uh, videotaped confession of a guy uh, for uh, murder. Uh, and he thought, and uh, the uh, uh, Court of Appeal uh, had just uh, ruled, uh, that was, by the way, shown in open court at his trial, uh, and the Court of Appeal then ruled that that tape was should have been inadmissible, and as a result, he walked the streets of Nova Scotia. So Claude thought, that's a story. Uh, so he uh, wanted us to apply for access uh, to, uh, to that uh, exhibit, um, and uh, the, uh, that person on the tape, for some reason, objected, uh, Mr. Nugent. And uh, he objected, and uh, I could not believe the process that we went through. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the Court of Appeals said that we were harassing an innocent person. Uh, you know, forget the concept of monitoring justice to see whether the right decision was made about ruling it inadmissible. That is a judicial act that we are allowed to scrutinize and monitor. Forget the fact that the Court of Appeal had done that. By simply asking to view this tape, we were harassing a person they had declared in a process we couldn't really scrutinize to be an innocent person. And we took that to the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, in, I think, one of the only judgments, uh, one of the few judgments that Justice Stevenson uh, issued when he was uh, on the Supreme Court, I was the junior member of the court, came out with a ruling that balanced a whole variety of things and uh, indicated that we had to explain what we wanted it for, uh, explained that we had to bring applications, and it became a very, very complicated process. And that became incorporated into the policies of a number of jurisdictions, slowing down the process. So you couldn't just ask for something anymore. Um, you had to apply formally with a lawyer subject to this process. Everybody had to have a say over whether you would get access to this exhibit, and that 
considerably slowed down the process. Um, the Ashley Smith case uh, has uh, uh, now ruled, and this was uh, supported uh, uh, a little bit later uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada um, in uh, a case coming out of Quebec on access to exhibits. They said that the Vickery case is now old law uh, because uh, it doesn't take into account uh, another case that the Supreme Court uh, enunciated, which is the Dagenet case, uh, which says that uh, you are not entitled to a, uh, uh, normally there's an open court principle, and to get a publication restriction, the person wanting the restriction is the one who has to make an application and has to prove that the restriction is necessary because reasonably available alternative measures won't protect fair trial interests and administration of justice interests. And so uh, the courts now say that that is not necessary, and they reminded us that according to Dagenet, the onus is on the person wanting to stop access to bring that application. So as soon as we go to court, we're supposed to get access automatically to that information unless somebody brings another application. And it's a struggle. Uh, the case uh, that you're, you're familiar with, the Williams case, was one where you know, we wanted to get access to the videotape confession of Russell Williams as it was introduced at the sentencing hearing. And we wanted to have uh, you know, the right to use blackberries in court. We wanted access to some of the pictures that were uh, going to be introduced as exhibits. Uh, and we were getting the same bureaucratic reaction at the beginning, at the front end of that. And we brought a formal application that we didn't think we had to bring. And we said we'd like access to this, which led to a process an informal process where the principles that I am now talking about were accepted uh, and we were, as a result, able to get a consent order just before the sentencing hearing and as a result, as soon as that material was filed in court, it was literally handed out in DVDs by the Crown uh, for us to be able to, uh, to report on. So 20 years of history, uh, getting back to where we were uh, 20 years before and uh, hopefully we're in a better place. Rob, we're hearing uh, a fair bit, including from you, about, about problems, problems with the system, but I, 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 just so it's, it's not all doom and gloom, can you, can you talk a bit about, uh, leaving aside how hard it might have been to, to get the information, but just from a journalistic point of view, some of the big uh, news stories uh, that have, have come through freedom of information requests? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that some of the you know, most important information we know about how we are governed uh, have come through, through FOI requests that were really hard fought sometimes over the course of years. Uh, everything from uh, mistreatment of Somalis by Canadian soldiers to uh, Shawinigate to the sponsorship scandal. Um, we at the Star have done Numerous FOI-based stories on abuse in daycares, um, mistreatment of foreign workers, um, um, dangerous doctors that have all resulted in public policy changes that have affected the daily lives of everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room. So, um, I, I, and don't get me wrong, I think it's still an incredibly important tool and I'm a big advocate of, for, to my students of, of learning how to use it well and learning how to um, figure out the state of mind required to deal with the labyrinthine challenges that are involved. And if you do that, I mean, ultimately, you're still on the side of God, right? At the end of the day, you're a journalist seeking public uh, information in the public interest that will affect, presumably, uh, th that is of value to everyone who's sitting here. It's about the, the safety of the food that you ingested today at lunch. It's about the safety of the air that you're breathing. It's about the, the use of your taxpayer dollars. These are important questions. This isn't, we're not playing around here. And um, so you can't ultimately ask these questions and be denied, uh, you'll, you'll absolutely be denied or, or delayed or, or face challenges. But I mean, in, in every case that I've decided, okay, let's dig in, let's play, let's go. I've ultimately ended up with maybe not everything I wanted, but through appeals processes and, 
and negotiations and those kinds of things. I can't think of a case where I was ultimately denied everything. I got something, and that something is enough to publish a story which leads to something else, which leads to something else, and often it, you can affect positive change that way. So it's still an immensely important tool, um, but those are often the exceptions. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I guess I ultimately disagree with Fred. I think there's a tremendous amount of obstruction. And we're not, and, and that's not to say, statistically, that may not, may not be true, but we're not here to discuss construction companies filing requests to get tendering information. We don't, that's not what we're here for. We're here to discuss public information that affects everyone here, not private information. And so on that score, I would argue that a large percentage of my requests face obstruction, and Julian Cher's requests face obstruction, and any journalist in this room face obstruction. And it's part of the system. It's not, it's not, even, it, it's not even a fancy. It's part of the system. It's a structure of the system. So yeah, we win sometimes. We win battles. But the, but the issue is we're losing the war. If I could just jump in, um, and I, I think it's important to note that uh, it brings to mind um, a commercial that's on TV, and it's like when I tell jokes or when I talk about commercial, I always get it wrong, but there's this woman, and she turns to a friend or her spouse, and she says, I wish I could pay lower interest fees. And so the person turns and says, well, then why don't you pay lower interest fees? <laughs> And I look at this act that came into existence so many years ago, and the right of access to the public is absolute, except for limitations that are specific. And I say to myself, well, if the majority of our FOI requests are private, general, should be routine, we know that we need to change our record management, uh, uh, the way we, ho we hold our records. We still deal with floppy disks in the Act, so we need to digitize our information. We need to allow people to get information over the Internet. We need to be able to not have duplications of records. Well, if we know this, then we as access and, and privacy professionals, you as journalists, you as lawyers, and the public have to make it known to your leaders who you elect that this is not acceptable. For the most part, 80% of the records that go through the FOI process don't need to. And the reason they continue to go through the process is because access and privacy professionals are not given the independence and the autonomy they require, yeah. and cities and ministries are not given the money they need to change their records. But we have the City of Toronto that is cutting back. They don't have money. We have many provincial ministries that don't have money. So we're at loggerheads right now. So if 10% of the records that go through the FOI process are contentious issues records, and they are from politicians or from uh, targeted uh, requesters, then let's not just keep saying the same thing over and over. We're in this room, we recognize that for the most part, obstructionism is not something that people enjoy doing. FOI officers don't want to do that, and most of the, the politicians don't do that. We have rare situations where the Information and Privacy Commissioners state very clearly this cannot continue. However, politicians are not covered by the Act, nor are their assistants. So if this is a problem, and if we feel legally we face challenges, then we have to stop saying it's a problem and do something about it. We have to give more money to records management, we have to give more autonomy to FOI professionals, and we have to make sure that journalists and access and privacy professionals work together with the public. Can I, can I just say, I, I totally agree with that, and, and it's everything that, that Suzanne just said is true, but here's, here's the challenge. Nobody cares. Like, there could not be an issue further off the public radar screen than what we're all sitting here talking about. Do you agree? Like, if, if we walk out on the sidewalk now and ask somebody about their outrage level over se government secrecy, are, are you kidding me? I've been working for 15 years to try and get this issue on the agenda. Nobody cares. And it's striking the difference between this country and the United States on the issue. There is outrage every time some two-bit city councilor withholds a document. It's a front page story. It's a scandal. Up here, it's just, uh, it's, I'm sure they're just doing their best, you know? <laughs> I'm sure they've got our best interests at heart. Well, in BC right now, there's a municipal councillor uh, who's been successfully prosecuted for giving information to uh, CBC. 
uh, contrary to the Access Act there. Uh, and uh, his uh, fellow municipal councillors uh, are in the process of uh, citing him for, for uh, uh, the equivalent of contempt uh, uh, for, having, for having dared to do this. And that's had uh, a very uh, interesting uh, impact on the public debate, but mm -hmm. it raises uh, what is uh, inherent in not only the court system, but also the, uh, you know, the common denominator, which is um, that uh, where you have uh, self-interest, uh, where you have a conflict of interest, uh, you're going to have uh, people who want to use the system in any way they can uh, to manipulate it to, uh, to get the results that they want, to keep information from the public. If you look at the structure of the act, which is the main problem I have, you look at the structure of the Access Act, uh, you are penalized. You're subject to sanctions if you give out information you're not allowed to give out, but you're not rewarded if you give out the information you should be giving out. And if the incentives were changed, then maybe we would get more access to information on a routine basis. I think something as fundamental as that is a lot more important than uh, you know, talking about how fast we process uh, within deadlines. I think that um, the, the public does care about this issue, uh, but the public doesn't care about the mechanics. I think the public, it's a bit of an inside the Queensway uh, argument of, you know, about how, but I think these things nonetheless are important because they, they cut to the heart of why the systems often break down despite the best intentions. Uh, interesting, I, Rob mentioned the, uh, the problems that journalists have. One of the things we found was that in the audit was that 30 percent of journalists' requests were abandoned, um, and often after very long periods of time. So there is statistical evidence that, you know, those people who want accountability are, are running into the problems. But I think it's really important to focus a little bit on where we might go, and I agree that there is a need, I think, to look for shared solutions that, that a paradigm of bureaucrats bad, journalists good, only goes so far that eventually we've got to get everybody talking and, and try to mobilize uh, opinion, both public opinion and the opinion of those who count, the people who make decisions, uh, to potentially change these things. And a couple of ideas that I've advanced and I might throw out here, I mean I think the first thing, you, one of the things you've got to do is you've got to give coordinators full delegated authority to make the decisions and beyond that I think that that should be subject only to an override by the head of the institution with reasons having to be given publicly. Uh, then, you know, the, if the deputy minister wanted to override the access coordinator on giving Rob Cribb some uh, a database, then the deputy minister would have to say publicly why this was being, why the considered professional opinion of the access professional was being overridden. Um, because obviously at some point, you know, the authority in the acts is still with the head of the institution. Unless you move that down to the access coordinator, it's going to stay there. But I think that that should be tempered. Um, we've got to eliminate these contentious issues, management processes, or in Ottawa they sometimes call it amber lighting or sensitivity. I, I know that um, the argument is made they don't slow things down. I think they definitely do. I don't know how you couldn't slow things down by introducing sign-offs or, or, or heads, heads ups to senior people, additional meetings, additional committees, um, and uh, public relations people having to get involved to produce media lines and, and briefing notes for ministers in case they're asked questions. I don't know how all this activity can happen without slowing down what's already a process that struggles sometimes to make it within the third days. So I think we've got to get rid of those processes. I think that they are, um, they're not designed, they don't, they're not within the ambit of what the Act's supposed to do. They're there to kind of protect the political class perhaps or um, the, the established class, but they're not there to, to facilitate the Act. And here's my most radical idea. The Supreme Court has said on a number of occasions um, that access is, is a fundamental democratic right. Um, that, it's, it's, that its essence is democracy, its essence is accountability, um, and uh, it's, it's even allowed that there may be some instances, although it's pretty weak on this, 
um, where access is actually uh, uh, covered by the uh, free expression guarantees in the Charter. Um, so, I mean, the, the court's given it pretty, uh, pretty elevated importance. Obviously, those accountability requests are the ones that are the small number made by journalists and politicians and interest groups. I think they should be given priority in the system. Right now, the system whips through these routine things, thousands and thousands of them, gives good service to somebody who wants to know if there's a contaminated property. But then if you're asking for something that really counts for the public, you're waiting. So why not turn it around and say, well, the routine ones can wait. They wait an extra six days, probably not going to kill them. And let's get those accountability requests out there, because that's what counts. You just touched on uh, what was one of the headline topics, although, frankly, I'm not sure how, how important it is ultimately when we hear about all the, all the, the practical problems. But uh, you've answered in part, and maybe, Danny, as, as maybe I'll give everybody sort of a closing two minutes, and in yours, could you actually answer the program question of whether there is a constitutional right to uh, access information? Sure. The, uh, Just yes or no, please. Yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> That's my position. Um, yes, uh, the uh, Supreme Court has said, and it's been building to this, that there is um, a right to gather information that is built into uh, the Section 2B right to free expression. Um, most recently, the, the, the question was, are these access to information acts uh, simply uh, there because of the good graces of the governments who brought them in, uh, or is there actually a constitutional guarantee, a right to government information? And you've noticed a little bit of a dichotomy on this panel. I've been talking about courts more, access to court information. They've been talking more about access to other government information. But what the Supreme Court has done is tie all that together in one night neat little with a uh, neat little ribbon, uh, and they've said that uh, Section 2B guarantees freedom of expression, not access to information, but they said access is a derivative right, which may arise where it is a necessary precondition of meaningful expression on the functioning of government. So if you can't have a debate because the information is in the hands of the government and you can't get access to it, then Basically, you can argue that there is a constitutional right to have access to that information. Um, and uh, that is beginning to play out in a variety of ways. The issue had to deal with whether a public interest override should be uh, imported into the Access uh, Act uh, in areas uh, where it hadn't been. Uh, law, in law enforcement, uh, solicitor client privilege, uh, and the uh, the court said, yes, you can, under certain circumstances, have the public interest taken into account. There is no public interest override per se, but it's actually built in to the Access to Information Act. The trouble is it's not specified, so it's invisible to all those bureaucrats who are applying the act on a daily basis. So the other day I was asking for a, a videotape that uh, a, a policeman had, uh, and he denied it to me because of the law enforcement exemption and really refused to apply the public interest consideration that the Supreme Court said uh, you know, had to be incorporated in the analysis. So we're just beginning to see whether that um, pronouncement by the Supreme Court is going to bear any fruit in the access area. But it does tie together access to information, the right to information from courts and to uh, right to ac uh, access to information from other government institutions. It's all one, one neat concept now. So there's a derivative and invisible right to, to information. Uh, closing comments, Rob, uh, in two minutes or less. Uh, any, any, anything other than the curmudgeonly uh, stuff? Or is it... <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's, here's... If you had to keep one part of the current regime, is there anything you'd... Keep? No, I would, I would nuke it. I would, I would nuke it entirely. Um, let me be lighthearted for a moment. Um, but uh, my, my proudest um, achievement um, on this score is about, about 10 years ago, I was president of the CAJ, and we started this, this cool annual award called the Code, the Code of Silence Award. And it's an actual award with a, um, a padlock hanging from a, a chain, and it goes to the most secretive government agency each year. So we take nominations, and. Um, uh, so journalists and public members of the public nominate uh, government departments and agencies um, for specific breaches of the spirit, at least, of the law. 
and uh, we of course invite them, the winner to uh, to a gala to to re receive the award. Um, and only so it's been ten years, I think, and only one has ever shown up. And it was uh, it was Michael Bryant, who was then Attorney General of Ontario, who would never miss an opportunity, of course, to stand in front of a photographer. And um, he was very smart. He, he won the award that year because Ontario had the highest fees to access court records, actually. It was, uh, to, to simply go look at a court file in Ontario at that time was like 30 bucks or something. And um, so he showed up and he, he received the award and he immediately slashed fees uh, to, to view uh, court records. It's now 10 bucks. It went from 32 to 10 to $10. And it was literally the only moment of the fleeting moment of uh, actual effect on the issue that, we, that, that I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, I think the only reason that that worked, and this goes back to sort of what Suzanne said, is that it got attention. Like, it, it actually, for, for a moment, there was radio shows and, and there was a moment where people were actually talking about it it was unique and it was kind of quirky and funny and sort of sarcastic and backhanded. And it was amazing and clearly inspired a focusing of the mind in that one instance. And it strikes me that if there's any way, I mean, I, I clearly have failed. I, I don't know how to do this. I, I have no idea how to engage the Canadian brain in, in the issue. But if there are ways uh, to do it, it, it clearly starts with engaging the public. There's just no, there's no other way around it. And um, so if any of you have wisdom, I, I'm a receptacle. Fred, closing comments? It's, uh, it's been a long road. Uh, I mean, I think there's a need to modernize these, these acts. Um, there's a million problems we can point to, but the one thing I would say is we're better with them than without them. Um, whenever we in the FOI audit ask for records from a place that doesn't have uh, the, the F to whom the acts do not apply, most of the time they just say, nah, go away. We don't have time for you. So this is a right. It's a right that's been given to you. It's a right that's recently and gradually been strengthened. People should use it. Um, yes, there are problems, but I'm sure glad we have it. And uh, I think we have to work to make it work better. Uh, but we'd be, uh, to, to, to sort of never use it, uh, too many, I, I mean, to, I would appeal to journalists to use it. Send in more requests. Journalists, as Rob says, are among the, among the, the smallest number. I mean, hundreds in three years. There were hundreds of requests from journalists in Ontario. This is a province of what, 14 million people? Mm -hmm. How many newspapers and radio stations and the CBC and like just a few? It's like fewer than one a day. I was astounded. So anyway, Suzanne, the Integrity Commissioner. Final word. We're all tired. We're all ready to go home. This has been a wonderful day, so I'll be very brief. I believe that education is the key. I believe that, uh, as Fred has said, the legislation we have is what works now. Without it, I believe we'd be worse for it. Uh, so I encourage you, as members of uh, the media, to learn about the Act, to speak with your access and privacy professionals. I would encourage access and privacy professionals to look at the professional organizations out there like CAPAPA, get educated about the act, and I would say to those of you who are directly involved with members of the political uh, layer of your organization to educate them. The good thing about most people is they want to do what's right, and I think that if we all look to that, as much as some may feel that it's, it's a little optimistic, I do believe that we are all people who want to do well, and if we know how to do it, educating each other, I think we can do it. So I'm going to keep doing this. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.